What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. In this video, we're jumping into Marauders issue number 6, Judgment Day tie-in. Our Marauders are finally back from outfighting the first generation of mutants. And while it was technically successful, they find themselves back here, back where their Celestial is judging them. And while mutant kind is battling on the front lines, there are still mutants out there that need rescuing. This of course is a job for the Marauders. But before they head out on this mission, they get to have a conversation with a mutant we haven't seen in quite a while. That of course is Birdie. Make sure you stay all the way through to the end of the comic because we are going to be talking about Cerebra, the mutant from the year 2099, being brought back here by Cable, being brought back so that she could be resurrected because she was dying, and then the year 2099, there is no resurrection. Make sure you guys have subscribed to the channel, make sure you like this video, and with that being said, let's dive into this break. Down. Alright gang, so our Marauders team, they are back on Krakoa, they are back on Earth, and not a minute too late because the progenitor, he is passing judgment on everyone, making them justify their own existence. The Marauders currently have a mission that they need to do, because there are mutants trapped in the altar, stranded inside of Legion's mind. This is because the gateways, they were destroyed, which means there is no way for them to return turned from the altar, the safe haven that Legion had created inside of his mind. And this still doesn't let us know where Legion is. The last time that we had saw him, he had gone toe to toe with Uranus, the two of them flying up into the sky above Araco, with only Uranus coming back down. But with all these mutants stranded at the altar, this means a rescue mission. Kate Pride currently talking to Fabian and Cassandra Nova as they sit here and they form the gate that they are going to need to use, saying that the people that are going to come through this gateway, they are going to need help, they are going to need healing, they are going to be scared, because the whole reason that they are in the altar to begin with is some kind of chance at healing from their trauma, being judged by a god, being told that they might be the reason that humanity is going to get wiped out, that the entire planet will be obliterated. It's a lot to carry on your shoulders. And that's what takes us to Hellfire Bay. That is where we have Birdie. Now, Birdie has been helping Aurora with her more or less multiple personality disorder. And Birdie has just recently learned that Somnus can drop all of them into a dreamscape where time moves much slower, which means 10 minutes in the real world inside that dreamscape. It could be hours. And so this is all Birdie is asking for, to gather the crew of the Marauders, put them into this dreamscape, give her 10 minutes, you guys can go rescue whoever you want, it's gonna take about that amount of time for the gate to grow anyway. You can call Birdie a combat psychologist. She is the one that used to keep Sabertooth calm. Her gift she refers to as the glow. Empathy, telepathy, taking thoughts, feelings, and memories, and being able to help people to heal from their trauma. And and since she has been working with Aurora, Aurora believes that maybe, just maybe, she can help everybody else. This is when we go into the mind of Bishop, being shown exactly what the Celestial had shown him. He is sitting down with Malcolm and Randall, his old crew from back in the day, or the future, depending on how you look at it. Now, he knew this was a test. He knew that this was the Celestial. He is one that usually knows exactly when he is, where he is, and so it wasn't easy, or it wasn't hard for him to figure this out. But what they are asking him is why haven't you resurrected us? We were your teammates. They died fighting next to him. Why aren't they good enough for this utopia? Why is he here and they are not? The truth is, for Bishop, he is not waiting to resurrect them because this world is too good for them. He wants to make this world good enough for them and then bring them back. That this world isn't good enough for them. This is something the Celestial threw into Bishop's face. And while he may not like to admit it, it was pretty traumatic for him. But that is why Birdie is here, to help him, to heal him, to help him move past all of this, so they can focus on the mission. That's when we jump into the mind of Aurora. Her
her and all of her different personalities, the progenitor appears to her as an individual by the name of Headlock, the Celestial saying that you should be able to prove why you deserve to live. Now, Aurora, she's not hearing any of it. Using her mutant ability, she blasts the crap out of this projection into her mind. The truth is, Aurora doesn't care about his judgment. She has been working to better herself all of this time, and she is not going to let some god come in and try and ruin this. Jumping over to Tempo. She is having a conversation with Sumo. Of course, this is not in fact Sumo. This is the progenitor asking Tempo, why did you allow Sumo to die? Why should Tempo get her happily ever after? And he does not. But she knows deep in her heart that Sumo made his own choices. He didn't know what it would cost him, but he made those choices of his own mind. But because of her mutant abilities, she fully understands the cost. There is a reason that she doesn't just go back and change the past. Because if you're successful, most people don't even know about it. It. But she is one that always remembers. Going back to the days when she was part of the Mutant Liberation Front, her and Sumo weren't really that close. They got ambushed, nuked every single one of them. She tried to warn Sumo, but he demanded that they change the past. So both of them, they went back. Sumo stopped them, saved both teams, saved Cable. The timeline had revised so their, their mission never happened. But the next time that they ran into X-Force, Cable had shot him in the head. She doesn't want to justify why she doesn't go back into the past. But this did make her rethink things. And she is going to be really trying to push for Sumo's resurrection. That's when we hop over to Psylocke. The progenitor coming in the form of Sinister. Which is a very cruel thing. Because Sinister is the whole reason that she she no longer has her child. Sinister had been keeping her child's DNA hostage. That way that she would do his bidding. Especially when they were part of the Hellions team. And so she didn't even give this Celestial a minute to speak. As he lay there dead on the ground. He spoke anyway. Letting Psylocke know that you're supposed to convince me why you should be spared. Taunting her trying to get underneath her skin. But the reason she believes she deserves to live this life is because she finally has her body back. She has the possibility of making some kind of difference. She fights in the names of those that she has lost, and that includes her child. She is not giving the progenitor a justification. She lets the god know that on the battlefield, that is where you will find me. That is where you will find my justification, where she will stand against the god until she can stand no longer. That his actions are an intrusion, and she will make this god pay in blood, blaring in anger, but nodding in approval. Jumping over to Somnus, the progenitor had come as Jean-Paul, but he quickly learned that this was in fact inside his dream. And if the progenitor comes to him in his dream, Somnus, he is a god in his own right inside his dream. So it doesn't take long for him to just get rid of the progenitor, regardless of his judgment, regardless of what he is going to say to him. The truth is, most of our mutants, most people, they don't care what the Celestial is going to judge them. Now, there are many different factors and reasons on why they don't care, but the majority majority consensus is that Celestials can go F themselves, but it also appears to be making them better people. Even going into the mind of Dakin, the Celestial doesn't appear as somebody else, but the Celestial is him, taking one of his claws and jabbing it into his own freaking head. He is not afraid of judgment. He is not afraid of what he will be judged as. The truth is, he knows exactly what he is. This god is already too late in coming to tell him that he deserves to die. This is something that he is very well aware of, but as long as he has breath, he will protect those he loves, those he cares about. And in this time, 10 minutes has passed. Hours of therapy has been done. Everyone waking up and everybody feels a little bit better. They had an opportunity to talk through all of their trauma, everything that they have been dealing with, everything that led them up to this moment. This is referred to as hyperbolic time therapy. Breaking brand new ground, this is going to be revolutionary. We have months of work done in 10 minutes. 
as they turn around, they see that the gate has been completed. And so while they prepare for their rescue mission, while mutant kind moves on the celestial, in the background, we finally get to see some Orcus. Because while mutant kind is battling their battle against the Eternals, while the world faces celestial judgment, while mutant kind is escalating tensions, Orcus is going to use this to their advantage, telling them to get all the footage they possibly can. That if Earth does continue on, if they pass judgment, they want it to be clear who brought them to the brink of extinction. Everything bad that mutant kind has done, from Brimstone Love to Thunder Bird's assault on a police officer. This is another petal of the Orcus. They plan to win the hearts and minds. And so while mutant kind fights for their freedom, Judas Traveler is ensuring that they get seen in the worst possible light. And as we close out this issue, this is where we get Cerebra writing to Kitty Pride. Cerebra has just come from the future, where she is leader of the X-Men of 2099. On the brink of death, Cable had brought her here so she could be resurrected. In the time that she had left, mutant kind was just on the verge of finding their forever home. She had thrown herself in the path of Celestial, but in 2099, there is no five. There is no mutant resurrection. And while she's not ready to jump into battle to do any kind of craziness, she does want to open up the time drive, the one that is keeping mutant kinds trapped inside, the first generation of mutants, not knowing how many are in there. Presumably, there is only one individual, but there could be more. And in this era of Krakoa, this is the perfect time to be. With her mutant ability, she will be able to take the information off the time drive and put it directly into an egg. When it hatches, we will have the first generation. They will return, and we could see them within Judgment Day. And that will be the end of this issue. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. This issue was big on just healing from trauma. You know, we've seen that going around a lot inside Judgment Day. Everyone is feeling guilty, feeling bad, feeling shame, feeling all these negative emotions. Morale is at an all-time low. Even Emma Frost is feeling bad. What Birdie is trying to do is get these guys' minds right, get them on the battlefield where they belong, fighting against the Eternals. We are finally seeing just a little sign of Orcus. We have yet to see Nimrod or Omega. Omega Sentinel or Omega Moira. They have been hiding off, keeping in the distance. More than likely, they're just waiting to see how all this plays out. I think my biggest takeaway from this is going to be the little excerpt that we have from Cerebra of 2099. Now, if you followed everything that happened with Cable, you'll know that the Krakoa era, at least from the timelines that he has seen, it does not exist. That it is nothing more than a footnote in the history that that is mutant kind. And Cerebra is kind of solidifying that idea, that resurrection, the five, Krakoa, this era of mutant kind, while it is one of the highest peaks of achievement for them, this era does not last forever. Now, the timeline is always changing. Things are always going in different directions. Sinister has clones of Moira. He is able to reset the timeline anytime he likes. Then you have Destiny, who is also out here predicting the best path. There are so many variables, but it appears, or at least it's been written so far, that while Krakoa is one of the pinnacle moments of mutant history, it is not something that is going to last forever. Eventually, Krakoa will fall. Resurrection will go away. And even 80 years from now, they will still be fighting for their freedom. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know your theories. If you would like to get completely caught up on everything going on with this series, be sure to check out the link in my description as well as the top of this video. It is going to get you completely caught up on everything happening with Judgment Day and the Marauders.
If you would like to support the channel, you can always do so by joining the channel membership. Much like Patreon, having multiple different tiers from $1 to $50. Loyalty badges to being a guest on the show to talk about comics. This monthly subscription to the channel helps us out tremendously. But if you can't do that, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit that notification bell, and with that being said, until the next breakdown.